Okay, so let's get started. So, so the, uh, the, the craziness is, there are people that live in the world that live in like Geula, Mea Sha'arim. That's like one, there are, and there's people in other places also. But people that live there that are not connected to technology, right? They don't have anything to do with like these type of stuff or, or phones or, or whatever, internet. Google Glass, you know, the glasses that they have? So the whole thing is really sick, but that you could like, you look at someone and it will identify who that person is. You understand what I'm talking about? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah? So for those unfamiliar, there's something called Google. It's a company. Uh, it was actually originally made by some high school, uh, college uh, students for pornography, like every website. It was originally called Go Agle, and, and then they put them together. The numerical value of Google in Hebrew is 42, which apparently is the answer to all questions. And, uh, <clears throat> but back to our program, Google came along and they've invented many things. They probably invented this a long time ago and they just wanted to wait for the market so they can make more money. It's like the iPhone 6. They made the iPhone 6 about eight years ago, but they dumbed it down like crazy to the iPhone 1, right? So that you'll buy it and then afterwards, six months later, make you lose more money. In any event, the idea is they have something called Google Glass. Google Glass is like glasses. They have this little glass thing that, you know, you can surf the web, you can go online, just like with your, it's right in front of your eye. And, and they have face recognition, that when you put the, when the face comes on, when, when the glass sees a face, it will scan throughout the whole internet to find out who the person is in every picture of this person. So you look at these people that live a backwards lifestyle, that don't have internet, and they don't have phones, or they, let's say they have a landline or something, right? And don't have computers, and, and they're, they're just living old school, you know? They're living old school, otherwise known as living. And, you know, they're just living the life. And you look at them and you think like, oh, Nebuch, that's so bad, they're having such a terrible life. The government doesn't know where they are. <laughs> they live the best life. You understand? Google Glass would explode when they see them. They're like, hey, 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 pff, right? we don't know who this is. The guy doesn't have Facebook, you know? The guy doesn't have Twitter or, or anything else, right? Or what? MySpace. The, or MySpace, come on. MySpace? Yahoo. Yahoo. Doesn't have Yahoo. Twitter. Right? Doesn't have Twitter again. Right? <laughs> Neither time, the second or the fifth, right? He doesn't have these things, so in which case, it can't identify him. And, you know, it's, it's scary how, how much information is out there about us, and it, it, it's unbelievably scary. Some of you who are the less initiated to the knowledge of the idea of technology would be, will be shocked that when you go onto a website of some sorts, uh, Torah, anytime.com, uh, or Hidabrut, let's say, and someone goes on a website, and, and they notice on the sidebar, but they've blocked it because they have filters, but let's say you didn't. So you'll notice that on the side that they have all these ads. And these ads, it's crazy. They're like things that you want. Like you were looking at shoes the other day and there they are on the screen. Like amazing, what a coincidence. Or they're documenting everything you do always, yeah? In which case, and they're selling all your information to other people and basically it's scary. They, they, did a, they did a study once where, where they took all the information that somebody used on their computer and they, they didn't know who the person was, they didn't know where he lived, but they figured out his address, birthday, everything, just off the searches that the person did. Right, just off the searches. Right, so you're gonna think, but what do you mean? I went to the, I went to the incognito, uh, you know, control shift N, where no one could look at the history Right, so isn't it blocked? The answer is <laughs> no, nothing is, and they see everything, right? Who's they? <laughs> God. But, <laughs> but before we get to God, I want to say the fact that like, it's scary what people know about us. How many people here feel comfortable with handing over, let's say living a, does anybody here feel that they live a transparent lifestyle? In other words, you're totally comfortable with your mother seeing everything you've ever done. Yeah, <laughs> right? So, okay, so we have the philosophers who say, well, it all depends. And then we have the realists who say, of course not, right? We, we don't feel comfortable. I don't want anybody seeing me anytime, anywhere, than anything I've ever done in my life. That, that could be a little bit embarrassing. Hey, why, 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 why? Scary. It's all here. Now, Chavetz Chaim said, Chavetz Chaim, of blessed memory, a great sage, Rav Yisrael Meir Cohen Kagan, lived from 1839 to 1933 in Raden. 
He said that everything that's created in this world is created just for us to be able to make a connection between this world and the real world. Meaning the connection between what we call Olam HaSheker, this world, and Olam HaEmes, the world to come, the real deal, the connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu. Everything that we go through uh, is all there for us to be able to understand God. And he gave an example about the telescope. Dramatic pause. Move on. So he gave an example about a telescope. What's the telescope? He said, you know, there are those that have a thought that there's no God. There are others that think, okay, let's say there is a God. But he's so far in space <laughs> that he can't see us. Says the Chafetz Chaim, that's when the telescope was created. In order to teach you that even though something is unbelievably far, it could still see. And every day we get more and more clarity of this idea. My wife is a photographer, she is a camera. A, the first camera was called a Canon uh, 40D, I think that's what it was, 40D. Okay, right, so a nice, decent camera, right? Used to be, until they came out, used to be the camera, right? And then the 50, the 60, the 6, the 5, and the Mark III, right? Which is now, just mortgage your kid and you'll get one. Uh, but the idea is what, she, she bought herself a nice camera, and the cameras, I, I didn't realize how expensive they were, right? We spent, I think $1,200 just on the body, and then the lens was about 3.4 million. <laughs> it's an amazing lens though. In any event, the idea is my ridiculous amount, and I was going to New York, and my wife ordered it, and I was gonna go pick it up for it. And I don't know, what, I don't know anything about this stuff. I mean, I, I could pretend like I do, you know, I white balance those F-stops like no one's business. You know what I'm saying? I know what the aperture on the, uh, you know what I'm saying, right? In any event, so, so I went to New York, and, and I went to New York for a conference. It was Aisha Torah. The, by the way, you're in the Aisha World Center. And they have a, a conference every year called the, the Partners Conference. Coming up this November 14th and 15th in Connecticut. In any event, the idea is that the Partners Conference, I was there in 2009, I think it was, 8, 9, 10, I don't know. And, and I went to go get the camera. And then I was at this conference. I was there to speak. I was, that's the reason I was there, to, to talk. And... I got this camera, nobody knew who I was. I was basically new in the H world. I just started a couple years earlier. So I had this camera, I'm just taking pictures left and right. People thought I was a photographer. And then I got up to speak. And people were like, oh my gosh, you see how good Aisha Torah is? Even the photographers give speeches. Unbelievable, right? But in any event, the idea is, is that I took hundreds of pictures over this weekend. And weekend means it started Thursday night and it went till Sunday. Thursday night, Friday, up until like Shabbos, I must have taken over 500 pictures. I then take a picture, and everyone's like, they're, at this point they're posing, because they, when they see me, they start to pose. Like they think that I'm really a photographer. I'm like, hold on, <clears throat> oh, turn a little, chin down, okay, in, okay, go up, beautiful, a little walk please. Okay, anyway, the idea is, and like the rabbis were like, oh, really? oh the beard, oh, okay, like this, <laughs> the pious, okay. Anyway, the idea is, is that I'm shooting like crazy, I take all these pictures, and then I go back to look at the pictures. Cool, I take a picture, I look back, the picture, look back, and then I look back, it's gone. All the pictures are gone. They're gone. Has this ever happened to anyone before? Anyone, yeah? Where well, you lost a ton of pictures? I once did this to my dad, my dad's camera. He had a camera and it said reformat. Do you know what that means to reformat? Yeah. What is reformat? It's reformat. Right, so I didn't know that. I thought reformat meant like start or something. <laughs> I deleted all of my father's pictures. And he's like, well, I can't tell you what he said. But anyway, the idea is he wasn't happy. Yeah? And, and, and I went ahead and, and all these pictures disappeared. And I'm like, shoot, the, the guy who ran the conference came to me and he asked me, he's like, can you give me the pictures after so I could use it for the brochure? I'm like, sure. I can't tell you, any of them will be good, but you know, they're all like black they come out, you know, but, but okay. And, uh, and I'm like, oh no, now this guy wants them and they're all gone. So I go to the tech guy there, I'm like, what do I do? He's like, nothing. I'm like, what does that mean, nothing? They're gone. He puts it in his computer. I says, ah, ah, nothing. I came back to Israel, I said to my wife, what do I do? So she brought it to her teacher, the one who taught her the photography. And he said, he said, just give me the disc. I give him the disc. Within a couple of minutes, he got everything back. And then some. There were more, I don't know, I can't talk about what was on those pictures, but there were more things there. Yeah. <clears throat> Unbelievable, right? Unbelievable. How did he do that? The answer is, <clears throat> you take a picture, it's there forever. You type in an address in a computer, it's there forever. 
No, but I deleted it and I went into the history and I went to the background and I go to the AWRSQ 577286 right, file and I deleted all those things and you guys know what I'm talking about. And I went to all these things, all the answers, it's still there, it doesn't matter, it could all be gotten back. Until you burn it and then burn it and then burn it and then burn it and even then CSI's on you, right? You better watch it, yeah? I'm not gonna go into a whole little routine that I saw from Dave Chappelle, is that his name? Is that a comedian? Yeah, he has a song. Did you see that routine when he's like, officers come in and they, they walk around? I can't say because like, if there's no camera, you could say because God can't hear, but you know, now he can. In any event, he has this whole funny routine where they walk in, they're like, wait a minute. And they find something underneath an oven. They're like, it's a hair. He's 35 years old and black, right? And he's like, why does it always have to be black, right? Anyway, the idea is that, that at the end, they'll find it, right? They'll find it. It's scary. It's unbelievably scary. Everything's being, everything, everything is written down. So it's the Mishnah, Mishnah Perkei Elvis. Found the chapter two, Mishnah one, and the Mishnah says the following idea. The Mishnah says, if a person wants to stop themselves from doing a sin, you want to stop himself from doing the wrong thing, what should you do? Da malam alam imcha, know what's above you. There are three things. What are they? Stakel b'shlosha davar and v'ena tabali deya. Ver da malam alam Look at three things you won't come to sin. Know what's above you. Ayin roe, a watching eye. What else, anyone know? Ozen Shomat, the listening ear. Keep going. Say it. No. V'chol ma'asecha b'sefer nechtafim. Everything's being written down. Now, you're correct also. But in this mission, it says a watching eye, <clears throat> a listening ear, <clears throat> with this, goes with everything you say, and everything is being written down. What does that mean? Why does the mission have to be so wordy, right? Just say a clear blanket. God is watching us. God is watching us. Why do you got to go? A watching eye, a listening ear, everything is being written down, right? Answer is because it's very specific. Everything you do is being seen. Everything you say is being heard. It's all being written down. It ain't going to be forgotten. You remember when you went in the room and you shut the door and you shut the blinds and you thought no one was watching? <laughs> We're all going to see it in high definition. <laughs> What's that? Aha, uh -huh. no, so let's take a look and see how you can see it. There was a guy who came to this class once and he told me he had a friend who was working helicopters in the army and he said, when you go in your room and you shut the blinds and you shut the door and you shut the lights, you think I can't see you? I can see you. How? Salmonella? So no, oh, I was like, yes, there's poison. Salmonella poison and lots of eggs. Right? I was like, infrared, right? Infrared. Thermal imaging. Thermal imaging right? You get to see, you can see. So I said, thank you for that. Next time I'm in the bathroom and I hear a helicopter, I'll wave. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, it's scary, right? but, but we're always being watched. We're always being watched. You think you're not being watched. You know, you know, like, what do we do? There's a classic thing that everybody does when they get to a red light. When you get to a red light, and assuming you stop, let's assume, yeah? You stop at a red light and you see someone at a red light next to you. What do you do? You look at them. You what? You look at them. And what do they do? They look at you. That's right. Everybody does it. What? They pretend they weren't looking. Exactly. Then there's a whole game. Right? You both pretend. Now, you don't want to make it seem as obvious that you're looking. So you do this thing where, you know, let's say you drive up. There's a car here. You pull up next to it. You do this thing where you start like this. You go like... Uh, and then you look at them and they're doing the same thing the opposite way so you, met, you, you like meet in the middle and you're like staring at each other and then you continue both going like oh, you been do no, and you look it away I was uh, what I like to do now I, I, I have a different car but when I I had a, I had a Mazda 5 and, and the Mazda had the seat wasn't electric it was manual you know, the lever that you lift up and you move the seat back and forth. So what I would do is, as, as I would, if I saw a car parked at a red light, as I got closer, I would slowly lean the seat back. And the closer I got, the more back, until I was all the way back. And the person would be looking, and they wouldn't see anyone. And then they'd keep looking, and I'd keep moving back, until finally, when they're all the way this, I would pop forward, right? <laughs> I used to do it, I would drive through the tunnel on the way here, you know the tunnel to get to the old city? You know, so the, the cars come in opposite directions, so I would drive like this, my wife didn't like it, but I would drive like this, you know? And then I saw this one guy, he's like looking up, and I go, ah, he goes, ah! He's like, I don't know what he said, it was something in Hebrew. In any event, the idea is, is that 
We're always being watched, people. And you know, like when you watch someone and you think that's crazy, they don't know I'm watching them. <laughs> Someone's watching you, watching them, and you don't know that they're watching you. Can I, it, it, it's a crazy world. It's a crazy world. I, I got, okay, I got so many stories. I got to this red light. So what happens? I get to this intersection, and, and here's the, I, I come over here, and that's a car. And uh, this guy was over here. So naturally, we do our little thing. And when I look, I see he's not looking at me. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. He's looking in this direction. So I look over and I see in front of us that there's a motorcycle. That's a motorcycle. Glasses motorcycle. Uh, there's a motorcycle. And there was a girl in the motorcycle. Yeah, you'll excuse me for this, ladies. I apologize if you get offended by this. I just found it funny. I did find it funny that there was this woman on the motorcycle, partially because she was about nine years old, right? That was it. It was this big motorcycle. Here it's legal. And uh, she's sitting there, and this guy is staring at this woman. And I'm thinking, this is too precious, because he doesn't see me. She wasn't here, I want to be more accurate. She had pulled up, you know, like all motorcycles do, they like come around, and they go like that, and then, then they stop like in the intersection, you know? So he's staring at her, and I'm like, this is awesome, because he doesn't know that I'm staring at him, staring at her. So what I did is I slowly moved up just a little bit to block his view. And so he moved up just a little bit so that he could see, yeah? And he wasn't paying attention. So I moved up a little bit more, yeah? And then he moved up a little bit. And he's like doing this as he's moving. Finally, you see he got frustrated. He looks over at me and I'm like... <laughs> and he went from looking like... like right? And all of a sudden, like, forget it. We're being watched, right? We all know we're being watched that the Chafetz Chaim said, it's just a muscle. It's all a muscle. It's just an analogy. Everything is an analogy for us to understand the creator of the world. Now, this is a bit scary. The concept's a bit scary if you think about it. Right? Like, oh, I'm really not meant to be focused on fear as much as we are in love, but, but sometimes there's an idea that you've you got to get a little kick in the pants, right, to wake up a little bit. If there'd be no fear, that's dangerous. If a person lives a life of no fear, that's dangerous. Is anybody a friend like that, or you? Lived a life of, like, no fear? And they would be in sports, there'd be no fear, they would do crazy things. I guess not anymore. Right, but the idea is what? Craziness. If you have no fear of anything, so, so that, that leads to dangerous things. Same idea, so you would ask, like, why does God create a thing that this idea of loving him and fearing him? Why fear him? What's the, why not just love him? Wouldn't that be lovely just to love him? Now, it might be lovely. It might be quite lovely. What you going to do? It might be very lovely. But the only problem is that if you just love someone, that doesn't stop you from doing the wrong thing. Yeah? I mean, after all, what's love got to do with it? So therefore, who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? So we have is, yeah, 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 so we have is that a person doesn't have any fear, so then what happens? Then they fall. You gotta have something which is holding you up and, and keeping you in, in line. So therefore, we have the following idea. We have, understand, everything you do is being seen. There's a, an amazing story, amazing story, which I don't know if you guys heard the story, didn't hear the story. There was a, a couple at this wedding and, and the father of the bride, father of the bride had in his pocket $10,000, right? Because he had to pay off the, uh, got to pay all the, the florists and whatever and the drug dealers uh, and the photographers and whatever. And after, uh, <laughs> slipped there again, sorry. We'll talk after class. Uh, so, so after, you know, he's walking around, the people are coming and saying congratulations and he's like, you know, saying like, he's like, that, you know, don't come too close, you know? But he gets used to it. He starts to forget about the money. It's cash, right? Why, why, why didn't you have a check? Great question, but this is what happened. Yeah, so the guy had his money. And, you know, as, as the wedding progressed, as the wedding progressed, he got so comfortable that he forgot about it. And the dancing started. And he started dancing and dancing. And it was a, you know, religious wedding, men dancing separate, women dancing separate, which makes the dancing a lot more enjoyable and crazy. Because right, every time it's mixed dancing, everyone's trying to impress the other one, you know, who's a better dancer or whatever. So yeah, people actually have a good time. And the guy's like, oh, it's getting hot in here. Foreshadow. It's getting hot. Foreshadow. So what does he do? He takes off his jacket. Foreshadow. He takes off his jacket. And he puts his jacket down on the chair. And he continues to dance. And he's the father of the bride, right? He's dancing with the groom, and he's dancing with the father of the groom, and, and he tried to dance with the bride, they threw him back to the other side, and, and it continues until they finally end the first set of music. Now what happens, you know, a Jewish wedding, the first set of music ends, what do people do? People collect their jackets, I think. Right, or they keep dancing, right? They just ignore it and they keep dancing, right? And the guy gets up, says, everybody please find your seats, and he says, they just keep dancing. Next announcement, if you don't find your seats, you will not get any food, the dance floor is clear. 
Yeah, everybody finds their seats. And the guy remembers. Me abrigo. Me de la plata. And he goes, oh no. So what does he do? A jacket. So he quickly goes back and he finds his jacket. He puts his on. He reaches in the pocket and... The money is still there. But another story is that the money was gone. And he's like, oh no. See, I put the put the water. And go to the check of it. They locked down the whole place. Like we're checking every person here. A little bit embarrassing. We're about to groom everybody over there. We're going to check it all. A lot of money. $10,000. So they start checking every person there. Nobody's got the money. Okay, what can you do? Part one. Part two. A few weeks later, he gets a phone call. It's from the photographer, the videographer. He wants to come over to the father of the groom. Don't get confused, right? The father of the bride, you know, lost his money. He wants to call the father of the groom, and he's of the Hatan, the Nen, and he says, I want, to, uh, I want to show you footage, pick for the album, for the video. He says, great. Comes over, takes a DVD, gives him the DVD. He says, okay, he takes it, puts it in, sits down. In the meantime, the photographer makes himself at home, goes to the little bar, makes himself a drink, a little orange juice, a little vodka. What's that called? Excellent, I'm very proud of you guys. <laughs> very proud of you guys. It's called a screwdriver. Makes himself a little drink, and he's watching the video. And as he's watching the video, as you see, he sees people are dancing and getting into it and going wild. And all of a sudden, what does he see in the background? He sees the father of the groom. Who's that? He sees himself going to the jacket pocket of the father of the bride and taking the cash. Caught your red hand, it wasn't me. This guy's over here with his drink and he's like, yeah, I saw it. <clears throat> saw what? Like, what are you talking about? It's like, listen, I'm not such a bad guy. Cut me in. You give me a percentage, and I'll edit the video. And don't think you could destroy it, because I have five more at home. And don't think you can kill me, because I sent a message that if I'm not back by Tuesday, send it to the world. <laughs> You're not getting out of this. How much... How much would you pay? What's your name? Suya. Say it? L-I-A-V? Yeah. Oh, wow. My brother's name is Eliav. I thought that was, that's so special. Okay, Liav. How much would you pay to edit that video? How much is your total? <laughs> $10,000. Assuming that I was the type of person who would steal them. The Ooh, good response. Very good response. Most people just go, with, I give like 5,000. Like, so you would do this, right? <laughs> You're like straight up, no. Assuming you would do this, how much would you give? And don't pull this move on me and say, you know what, I would just return the money. I would just return it. Because you're finished. You're coast. You're, I already sold them and I probably wouldn't. That's what there's not. And you can't anymore. It's already out. What are you going to do? You're going to return it? The guy's going to let the video go. Your business is done. Your, your relationships are done. Your, certainly your kids' relationships are done. How much do you think someone would pay to edit that video? 15%. 15%? What if the guy says he wants 40? 20. 20, that's it. Okay, 20. 80. The guy says he wants 80%. Would you do it? What if he wants 110%? He wants more money. Still you still got to do it. Does everybody get that? No, because I've been recording this whole thing, and if he takes all of it, nope. I'll release the recording of him. Experience. No problem. He has no problem with that. Yeah, he does. Why? He'll be looked at a guy who blackmailed someone? So he blackmailed he someone. He his customers. He's never going to get any business. Okay, but he's got $12,000. He could chill a little bit. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's enough for that. <laughs> okay, assuming you haven't been recording it. Yeah, but if you had been, I hear that. But if you hadn't been, you'd have to pay whatever it is. Now understand, again, those who live the life of saying, no, I would just return it, forget it. It's over. It's over. It's like every movie, when you see, I, I know you guys don't watch movies, Chas Shalom, but it's like every movie. When you're watching a movie and you see they're about to do that thing, that thing, that thing, they're about to do it. And you're thinking in your head, don't do it. The video camera's watching. The, the security guard's about to walk in. Someone's about to find, you're like, don't do it, and they do it. Hey, what was that? Fatal Attraction. Anybody saw that movie, Fatal Attraction? Yes? So for those who have seen it, you know what I'm talking about. For those who haven't, you don't. But you get the point. A guy who had an affair. And you think, okay, the woman just will leave him alone. The woman came back after him and destroyed his whole life. Yeah? 
don't do it. You make that one mistake, don't do it. How much would you pay? Once you did it, it's done. People, at the end of our lives, we are going to be shown a video of our life. And the question is, how much would you pay to edit that video? Now you ask, what's that? Everything you, Everything you got, yeah? Now the question is, where do we find you out of this video? Who's gonna be watching this? Well, God will be there, you'll be there, your mother will be there. Not only that, but if you take a look, in the very last verse of Koheles, it states, Sof davar hakol nishma. That's how Lukim Tuev, it's Mr. Sof Tishmar, comes along the Targum and explains. At the end, alafanito. How do you say? At the end? Al final. Al final? Al final? Everything. Todos! Escuchamos. Yeah? Make sense? At the end, we're going to hear it all, baby. Everyone's going to be sitting there. Grandma's going to be eating non-fat popcorn. Like, oh, that's my little one. What's he doing in that room? What are you doing? No. <laughs> the idea is, is that how much would you pay to edit that video? Now, we have an incredible gift that was given to us. As a matter of fact, the Talmud says this gift was created before the world was created. Had this not been created before the world, the world wouldn't be able to survive. That gift is called? Teshuvah. Repentance. Repararamente. How do you say it? Arrepentirse. Arrepentirse. So, this is a longer word. Come on. Arrepentimiento. Yeah, there you go. Arrepentimiento. Right? That's called repentance. That's in Russian. How do you say it in Spanish? Anyway, that's called arrepentimiento. Right? The idea is what to go out and do. No, how do you say it in Russian? Rep there, is no, there is no repentance in Russian. Right? <laughs> it's called cement your feet and swim with the fishies, right? And it is what? Is that repentance? We have an incredible gift called teshuva. Now we can repent. We can come back. Come back to me now. Unbelievable gift. Unbelievable gift. But unfortunately, many don't take advantage, nor do many understand what it actually is. So first, let me, let me try to um, debunk or myth bust the idea that people think that they could float off a building with a two by four piece of wood. Oh wait, that was done by the show. Let me try to myth bust something else. And that's an idea that people think, and I, I've heard this many times, I've even, I've even maybe said it myself, I know. Hi. After all that we've been through, how could I make it up to you? I've gone, it's too much. You know, I've just done too much. You go to someone and say, come on, change your ways. Turn back what you've done. No, after all I've done, there's no way of going back. Has anyone ever heard somebody say something like that? Has anyone ever maybe had a friend, yourself, thought something like that? Yeah? In the beginning, you feel like, okay, I can turn back, I could stop. But then it gets to a point of like, no return. I'm like, what can I do? I want to share with you a Gemara. The Gemara is found in Avodah Zarah on page 17. Yud Zayin Amin Aleph, 17a. Towards the middle of the page, it tells a story about someone in the name of Elazar ben Dordai. Anybody familiar with the Talmud? Elazar ben Dordai. He tells the Gemara about Elazar ben Dordai. Shelo hiniach zona achas ba'olam shelo ba'ale apam achas. He did not leave over even one prostitute in the world with whom he did not have uh, a relationship with, let's say. Everybody got that? Pamachas, one time, Shama, he heard. He heard about this one prostitute. The Krache on the other sides of the, of the, of the oceans. Shai said, Otelis kissed the Narm Bishar. She took a lot of cash money. Mm -mm -mm. So he's going for Guinness. So what does he do? Takes the cash. Halach va'avar shiv in He travels the world in the seven seas. Everybody's looking for something. And he gets there. In the midst of the act, Bishas Hergel, whatever that act may be, Davar Hefecha, one of them passed gas. You don't have to look anywhere. The Talmud has everything. <laughs> the woman turned to the man and said the following. Listen to this. Keshem Shehefecha Zu. Eno Choser Slim Koma. Just like this wind, it's not going back to its place. Otherwise, you can have a major stomach ache. That's my little ad lib there. Kachelozer ben Dordai, 
Ain Mikavno Soba Chuva, so to a Lazar Mender die. You ain't ever going back to your place. They're not going to accept you in repentance. Now, that's a pretty harsh statement to hear from a prostitute. <laughs> you know, it's like, the, you know, it's one thing if it's your rabbi, you know, say like, repent, right? Or even those guys in Manhattan, the end is near, right? But the lowest of the low comes along and says, you ain't ever going to repent. Let's continue. He was like, what? That hit him here. It gets you right here. Anybody remember that commercial? Oh, that's too bad. A1 steak spice. Okay, anyway, the point is, that's intense. And that really, that, that got him. All right, that really got him. He's like, oh my goodness, how far I've gone. So he leaves. And he cries out, he says, Shemayim varetz, heaven and earth. The Bakshalei Rachavim, seek for me mercy. And they respond, before we seek for you, we got to seek for ourselves. Whatever that means, another discussion. He goes, Haram Ukvos, mountains and hills, Bakshalei Rachim, seek for your mercy. Before we seek for you, we've got to seek for ourselves. Chamul Levana, son of the moon, Bakshalei Rachim, seek for your mercy. Before we seek for you, we've got to seek for ourselves. Kochav Mazalo, stars and galaxies, seek for me mercy. Before we seek for you, we've got to seek for ourselves. And he finally comes to the following understanding, and he says, Ein hadavar toloi elabi. The matter is only dependent upon me. He put his head, be- don't ask me why I know this Gemara by heart. He put his head between his legs and he cried out until he died. Yotza Tabasco, a heavenly voice, came out and said, Rebbe Lozer ben Derdai, Rabbi Lozer ben Derdai, Mazumim Lachai Olamim, you're invited to the world to come. Loosely translated, Cielo. You're invited to heaven. There was someone named Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi was called Rebbe. When Rebbe heard about this, the Talmud says, he cried out, There are those who acquire their world in many, much time. There are those who acquire the world in one moment. There are those that can acquire the world in one moment. The Ben Chai says about Rabbi Akiva. He says, what's Akiva? The name Akiva? Those who are not familiar, Akiva didn't study Torah until the age of 40 years old, and then he started studying Torah and became one of the greatest sages. What's Akiva? It's an acronym. It's not in the, you have to switch around the letters, but the letters spell out Yesh. Kono Olamo Besha Achas. They're those who can acquire the world in one second. The end. Okay, now, now what just happened? You hear? This guy goes around, sleeping around with everything that walks, and then he gets invited to the world to come. <laughs> After he goes ahead and he does repentance, he goes to heaven. Any questions on this Talmudic statement? Or this story? Is he worthy? Say again. Does he deserve it? Because he's... What's your question? After so much sin, like, is there ever a limit? Judging by the, like, the end of the story... Apparently he got it, right? so he deserved it. Come on now, tell me something more. How about this one? I'll do the same thing. <laughs> You're telling me this guy just party hearty like there's no tamari, and then he goes in and does chuva, that's it? I'm going to do the same thing. Question or statement? Question. Well, he, passed away the next day. he passed away in the midst of his pain, right? He was so pained by what he did that it literally killed him. That's not crazy to hear, by the way. We know that even today. People can can cause themselves so much pain, mental pain, that they literally die. But there's a difference between you going out and partying and then having a mind that I'll do true by man, and this man doing what he did and then genuinely repenting. Okay, very good. So number one is the Talmud says, a person who says, Echte ve'ashuv, I will sin and then I will repent, then his repentance is not accepted. Even if it's sincere. Excellent. So generally no, meaning if it's sincere, then it's sincere. 
But the general understanding of it is that it's not sincere. Somebody, if I come to you and leave, I'm going to punch you in the face and then I'll say sorry. No, no, I'll really mean it. Like, <laughs> if I'm saying that, then clearly I'm, I'm missing a couple of screws, in which case I'm putter anyway because I'm a shota. But the idea is what? I'm, I'm clearly missing so a couple of screws. What? So okay, so when it's serious. In other words, when it really is. The general understanding of echta va'ashuv is not that it's sincere. But if it were to actually be sincere, a person has the ability of doing it. You hear that? So that's number one. Number one is echta va'ashuv isn't accepted because it's not sincere. It's got to be real. But what about if you really are real? How about that? Is it a good idea for a person to do it? Echta va'ashuv, he'll sin and then he'll repent? What do you think? What, what, could, what could not be good about it? If you can win the next world in one moment, Okay, but then let's get it back. If he dies before. Okay, this I think is the most prevalent problem. Muerte. Death. Person says, I'm going to party like crazy, and then I'll repent. <laughs> so he goes out, he's, you know, he's on the scene, he's involved with everything, cracks, man, PCB, LSD, heroin, weed, he's with all the chili, with chiquita bananas, and he goes out to the, to the, the things like, well, look, and then he dies. <laughs> you never know when you're going to die, people. Which is why the Mishnah says in Perkei Avos, Shuv Yom Echad Lefnei Mitascha, repent one day before you die. What's the obvious question? You don't know when that is. What's the answer? Day. Repent every day. So since you have no idea, so to say like, I'll do it, then I'll die, you don't know when you're going to die. There's another problem, by the way, besides this. Let's even say you knew when you are going to die. Fat chance. We have enough difficulty getting over our issues that we want to get over, let alone causing more issues than trying to get over them. Does everybody see that? Anyone have anything in them, any sort of qualities that they want to work on? Anyone? Four of you. Okay, the rest of you, we have to talk. Ah, uh, five. Okay, so yeah, so we have, right, everybody has qualities they want to work on. Is there anyone that's actually, this might not be, this might be, enough, this might be no, but is there anyone actively working on anything in your life in reference to your own character development? Anyone? Yeah? Is it difficult? Yeah. Okay, now I know you're telling the truth because it's unbelievably difficult. Now imagine taking upon yourself another issue, becoming an alcoholic or becoming addicted to fill in the blank. Now try to work on that also. I mean, what are the chances that we're actually going to overcome it? You realize that? It's unbelievably difficult. But also you don't know when you're going to die. Okay, that's one, one question that usually arises. Another question which arises is, well, it's not fair. It's just not fair. You have a person who goes ahead and, he, and, and he's a good guy his whole life. He's a tzaddik, a righteous person, his whole life. Como se dice righteous? No such thing, huh? Okay, so that's tzaddik, yeah? You got a righteous person. Someone's good. Tzaddik. Bueno. Bueno. Okay, un hombre bueno, right? And you got a guy, no malo. Yeah, you have someone who's like, oh, is a tzaddik, a righteous person. His whole life he's doing the right thing. He never messes around. But then you have this evil person who does all this, has a lot of fun. <laughs> and then he gets to become a tzaddik. Like, that's just not fair. What's the response to that? Righteous person knew better. Okay, knew better. What? He did to shoot on doing hard things. Who? The non righteous person. Well, I'm talking about, let's say, a righteous person that never felt, never did anything wrong, which is okay, he's shavi, he pulled out of but let's say a person who lived his life pretty clean his whole life. Is righteousness black and white? Isn't it a gradient? Say again? Isn't it a gradient? There's no, like, just yes or no. There's a scale. Go on. So when you get the world to come, it's not like a set piece that everyone will get or not. Oh, so in other words, well, number one is who says when this guy got all of my that he went to the highest of levels. He got in. He's on a low level. Right? That's what you want to suggest. Or he's not, maybe not on the level of Good, so maybe he's not on that level, that's one. But I'll, I'll, what? We know it's not true. Why? Because Bamako and Shalit Tikkun and Okay, uh, that would depend on the level of the Bachuva also, right? How much he did, how much he changed. Yeah, and that, by the way, there's also Bamako and Shalit I'm doing a feel about the I have to know what does that mean exactly. But besides all of this, there's another thing. This is, who cares if it's not fair? This has nothing to do with fair or not fair. Even if it's going to get in the same level with Sadiq or in a higher level with Sadiq, whatever. Bottom line is, who's talking about fair? Have anyone here ever met someone and, and you had a relationship? Well, let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. Um, do you have any friends? Do you have any friends that you've known for 25 years? Yes? Do you have any people that you have met over your lifetime that you've forged a relationship with them 
pretty quick, and it was a deep relationship, you've only known them for maybe a couple of months to a couple of years, that's maybe a stronger bond and a deeper relationship than the person you're for 25 years. You've experienced that in your own life? Has anyone else experienced that before? Mm-hmm. You can meet someone sometimes for a week. You go to yeshiva, right? And, 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 and you're stuck in a room with this guy. <laughs> so you love or hate him, but you get some sort of relationship. Yeah? And if it's a positive one, sometimes that goes unbelievably deep. You go back home to visit your friend that you've known for 10 years, and you just see that you don't have that same relationship that you had with this person you met for two weeks. What's going on? Not fair. It's not a matter of fair, not fair. It's a reality of relationship. Right? Maybe some of you will know someone, let's say, the, the kid in class is always doing pranks, the class clown. Right? People know, for some reason, it's always the people in the room. <laughs> let's get this. Right? So, so the kid is always doing the wrong thing, stealing tests and like disturbing and slashing the teacher's tires. And... Did I get too far? Uh, anyway, the idea is what? You have that kid. And that kid, one day, one of the other classmates comes to him and says, you know what's wrong with you? This teacher stays up nights preparing lessons so that you should be able to learn. And all you do is make, like, trouble? And you know what? No one ever said it to me like that. Uh, No one ever said it to the the person like that. It's always, you're bad. You're evil. Yeah? And the kid goes, you know what? I feel really bad. I I never thought about, like, a teacher as a human being. (laughs) And let's be honest. Let's be honest. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? You look at a teacher like, that's a teacher. It's not a person, right? It's kind of like a, a, a flight attendant. Flight attendants aren't people. Their job is to do whatever we say. Bring me water, and that's it. A mailman is not, an indiv- it's not a homo sapien. A mailman brings me mail, and th- that's what he does. Crazy. Isn't it crazy? We identify people with what they do so quickly. But maybe that flight attendant is a mother, is a wife, there's a sister and a daughter and a niece and an aunt and maybe a teacher. Maybe, who knows? You look at them, you look at them so they create. I have, uh, my, my uncle was on a plane. He was flying business, whatever. And, and he overheard, he overheard like a little ruckus. He was like half sleeping. And, he, you know, this guy comes on the plane and he tries to put his stuff in business class. Like in the things where, he was, in, you know, economy and coach. But he wanted to put his stuff in business. So the stewardess comes over and says, you know, in that pasted on smile, Sir, I can't feel my lips anymore. <laughs> and he says, Sir, you know, this is business. This is not for, you know. He's like, whatever, it's fine, it's fine. He's like, Sir, I'm sorry, but unless you have a business seat, you can't put your stuff here. He's like, I pay your salary, okay? Do you know, okay? I'll put it wherever. I pay your salary. And my uncle was like listening. He's like, huh? When they landed, this guy went over to my uncle because he saw he was in business and he was collecting money for something. So he goes, I, you know, I want to collect money. And my uncle said, you know, I wouldn't have said something. I just have to say, I was very disturbed about what happened earlier in the flight. And he's like, what? He's like, the way that you treated the stewardess. Like, I just, I felt that was a little bit wrong. And he was like, what? He's like, you pay her salary? He's like, it's true. Right? <laughs> and the guy was showed a little bit of embarrassment. He's like, I think you owe an apology. I don't think I'm giving you any money. I think you owe an apology. The guy didn't do it. He couldn't do it. He couldn't bring himself to apologize. But we identify people with certain things. Understand that what? Nonetheless, this teacher, he feels terrible. And he realizes, wow, it is a person. It is a mother. It is a wife. It is, it is an individual. I feel bad. So he goes to the teacher the next day and says, teach. I'm sorry. What's the teacher's reaction? Depends what kind of teacher. I guess it's like, what are you up to? You know, like, what is like, what, 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 what's going on here? Like, what, are report cards coming? He's like, yes, they are. But that's not why I'm doing this. I genuinely feel bad for what I've done. It may take time for the teacher to be convinced. But when the teacher is convinced, assuming it's sincere, what kind of relationship are they going to have? That's right. Not only a relation, a good one, a better relationship than that kid who brought an apple every day. I hate that kid. Right? A better relationship than that. I met him out in the schoolyard, you know. But a better relationship than that. But it's not fair. It's not a matter of fair, not fair. It's not a reality of a relationship, people. We have the ability of forging relationship pretty quickly, right? Understand, a person 
Okay, now, question is, which we didn't get into, we have one minute left and there's no way I'm going to do it. So what I'm going to do right now is a quick recap of everything we did, and we're going to God willing to continue with this next week for those who are going to be here. Probably none of you will be here, and I'll have to start over. But you won't know that because you won't be here. Okay, but if you are here, maybe we'll continue. Okay, so what do we do? We start at the beginning of the scene of what happened. People being watched, moving, sitting on the back, flipping forward, right? Except for the Hasidic guy, I guess he's not going to have anything told him because there's no Google Glass can identify him because he's not Facebook. But at the end of the day, recognize the fact that we are being watched. It's unbelievable. Sit in the can. What happens? It high helicopter, right? We're being watched all the time. Remember, you shut the door. We know it's going on. No, my grandson. Who's going to be there? Grandma is going to be watching a low fat popcorn and a Diet Coke. And saying what's happening, people, everything's about so tough. I call this my toro, right? Right? Everything is what everything is heard. You understand? But we have reparamentos. Right? There's more we can go on. We can do chuva. A person has the ability of editing that video. How much would you pay that video? Assuming you'd be the type of person, God forbid. But if you were to be, what would you do? Well, we pay a heck of a lot, even more than you'd want, because then I want to get it off my thing. Understand? People, it's very scary. We have the ability of doing it. How teshuva? Says the Gemara. Without the teshuva, the world would be able to exist. That's where the world was first. It was created. You have chuva, and then only one after. That's so understandable. After all that we've been through, I've done so much, I ain't no way I can go back. At laws are banned or die. I don't know what you guys have done in your life, okay? But even if you did this, you travel the world and the seven seas, if, even if you did that, ain't davar omed bifnei hachuva. Nothing stands in the way except, not, except, not, except nothing stands in the way of repentance. A person always has the ability of coming back. Since people, we have to understand what it is and how to do it. And if you don't figure it out, so good luck. But you should try to figure it out. Coming Rosh Hashanah, now is our opportunity. And we have an incredible one. Take advantage. Don't mess it up. Until next time, I'm your host. And uh, God willing, we'll see you when we see you. Take care and have a great day. Mm-hmm.